Drivable podcast where we discuss all things about driving and safer community transport for people with disabilities and medical conditions. If you haven't done so yet, make sure you go back and listen to the last episode. That was our very first episode and we introduced Brad and myself and we talked through why we're doing this podcast and why we're so passionate about it. We really encourage you to go back to listen. This is episode two and this week we'll be having our very first guest and I couldn't think of a more fitting person to join us. Yeah, I'm super excited by this episode as well. Today, um, we have Kwa. You might remember him if you ever watched the TV show Taboo, uh, which was on uh, a fair while ago now, but he's, he's gone on to bigger and better things from there. That maybe kick-started his career, but we're super excited to uh, chat to him today. Uh, Ali, you ready for this? Let's do it. Kwa, you ready for this? Down and ready. Let's do it. Driving is something many take for granted, but when someone has altered ability, then driving or getting out and about in your own car can be challenging. Driving with a disability doesn't mean you have to drive an old clapped out car with farm-like machinery, and relying on a wheelchair doesn't mean waiting for hours and then being in the back of a maxi access cab getting car sick. The Drivable podcast is designed to introduce and explore driving aids for people with disabilities vehicle modifications, the NDIS, research, medical guidelines, driving techniques, and much, much more. The Drivable podcast is to help you be informed and be in control of your own independence so you can experience freedom through driving safely and reliably. I'm Ali, and with me is Brad, and together we have over 30 years of experience in disability and driving. Enough of the intros, let's get into it. All right. Uh, on this episode, we are talking to Kwa and unpacking his story. Kwa, do you want to introduce yourself and then let us know what disability you've, you've actually got? Hi, guys. My name is Kwa Nam Tran, and I'm a motivational, inspirational speaker and a business owner. And yeah. I am a bilateral osseointegrated amputee, one below knee, which doesn't really bend and one above knee which is basically my main leg my main leg that leads yeah which leg's that one that's the right leg that's the left right. leg is the one with the knee that is you could say it's kind of fused what's 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 osteo integration for the people that don't know and that are listening to this what's can you explain what osteo integration is yeah, so traditionally amputees would start in a socket. So it's been over for, uh, I'll say, hundreds of years when an, a person's amputee, they'll be in a, what would you call like a bucket strapped around your thigh, your knee. That's the archaic style. Yep. Osseo integration, on the other hand, is it's a kind, kind of fairly new technology in the amputee world. And it involves implanting a titanium rod, titanium stick, whatever you want to call it, into your bone. In my case, into my femur and my tibia. Yeah. So that, that actually goes inside the bone. Is that right? Is that, they kind of drill out the middle of the bone and, and attach it inside? Yeah, that's correct. So your bone marrow fuses together with a titanium rod and it acts as one. Wow. Yeah, right. That's interesting. So that, so that becomes the bone of your leg, yeah? And then it's an extension. Yeah, so basically I'm weight-bearing all my weight how a normal person would do on your bones rather than if I was in a socket, I'm weight-bearing on my skin, which isn't ideal because your bones will become weaker if you haven't used it in a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. In my case, I'm using it using it 24 hours a day yeah yeah uh, how long does that process take to do on your body in my case it was a one-step procedure and then from there on it was two weeks of weight bearing and then i stood up on a not my not my leg but a loner leg where it's lighter and just between parallel bars just to slowly adapt to it again slowly learn how to walk again because it's like learning how to walk again exactly how it feels like well i don't remember since i was a baby but you could yeah. understand how it would be <laughs> yeah yeah 
Yeah. Mate, so what, so what happened? Where, how did, how did you get to this point? I mean, you weren't like, you weren't born this way. It was like, you just hinted at there. What, what happened, mate? Well, it was, I was, I was a typical, typical dude, 29 years old, having fun, always drinking, you know, going to parties, having no care in life, just living as if it was the last day. Unfortunately, it was almost my last day. I had quite a few drinks at a club, but I was okay with that because I knew that I wasn't going to drive home. I had a lift there and the plan was to catch a taxi back home. Three weeks later, I woke up in hospital. Mm. Amputated. Only to find out a day or so later that I was the rear passenger and my mate was driving. At that point, I did not know how I even got into the car. Even an hour or so after entering the club, it was a blank canvas. I did not remember a thing. All I remembered was waking up on Boxing Day 2012. I guess that was a gift for my family when I opened my eyes. Eight years ago. Eight years ago, correct. Eight, year, eight years ago on the 9th of the 12th. Yeah. yeah. And what, so you were in a coma for two weeks? Yeah, almost three weeks. I was in an induced coma. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. interesting. And so what were the things going through ahead of that point? Yeah, you woke up and your legs weren't there. What happened? What, what, how, what, how, what was that first moment like? Well, that first moment... I'll say it will shock a lot of people because I wasn't, I wasn't traumatized. I was still in my heavily medicated world, as in all the painkillers that they given me. I was still in La La Land when I woke up, and I was, I was very calm. I was calm to the fact that when my mum told me that I had no legs, I shrugged it off. I guess that's very unusual, and it, it threw a lot of people off, but... I was fine with it at that point in time. It was only once the medication started to wear off, that's when the realization that I really did lose my legs came to effect. When that happened, that was, that was a shock, mm. you could say. But I was... I had time to reflect. I was in the hospital for three months, but in that first moment, I had time to recollect why, why this happened. I, I was kind of down in that moment. And you could say I was, I was feeling self-pity. Mm. Was the, who, who was there in those early days around you? Like what people? My mum, my, my brother, my sister, my dad, they were there every single day coming to hospital, delivering food. Because at that time, at that moment, I wasn't eating anything. I had no taste buds. I thought I lost my senses. All I could eat, all I preferred to eat was mangoes. And yeah, mum didn't yeah. fail in bringing me mangoes day in, day out. <laughs> day in, day out. Mums That's all amazing, I ate mate. for yeah. the first couple of weeks. It yeah, was heaven. Good, good sugar, good sustenance, good carbohydrates. You yeah, know, and then once, once I started to recover my taste buds, then I kind of liked the hospital food. But yeah. then, you know, you get, you get sick of it after a while. And then you're back on the mangoes. Yeah, I'm back on the mangoes. <laughs> <laughs> and was there like anything or any person or any moment that um, kind of flicked the switch, I guess, for you? Because you said you were sitting in a point of pity, but obviously you're not in that position now. So it, like something or was it a gradual thing? Or It was not a gradual thing. It was more of a like 
imagine the stock market shooting up. Yeah. It was just a, a sudden, a sudden realization that why, why do I need to feel the way I felt at that moment? Because if I kept feeling sorry for myself, I'm not going to go anywhere. The world keeps evolving. The world's not going to wait for me. Yeah. So why would I hold myself back in terms of thinking what could have, should have, would have? Why did I go in that car? Why did I party? All past tense. Whereas I was looking at what I could do now. What, what endless possibilities having no legs. And one thing came into mind. I so could be taller. What I mean, taller? <laughs> Did your wish come true? It came true, it was right. <laughs> How much taller are you now? Oh, I'm a good, probably five centimeters taller than before. <laughs> I was at a point ten centimeters, but I told my processors to drop me down because it was, <laughs> it was, it was getting a bit scary. But then that was at the early stages of walking. I think I'm confident now to raise myself up again. <laughs> right. That's bloody awesome. Just like change your height. <laughs> yeah. You know, who says when you go old, you go short? Not my case. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> you're going to have, you're going to have this hunched over back, but your legs are going to be like a mouth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be so disproportionate. It's going to look funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, mate, so when you when you woke up, I mean, I, I assume you didn't have the osteo integration at that point. When when did that happen? That osteo integration happened a just, just over a year and a half, around almost a year and a half later. Yeah, so you were walking. You were walking on uh, other prosthetics at that point, the traditional prosthetic with the socket. Yes, that's correct. I was walking on traditional sockets. For rehab, so I was at that moment. I was fine with, with walking with sockets. Little did I know the the uh, the problems that arose with it. With uh, okay, talk us through some of those. Sockets wouldn't fit properly. I'll it would take a good ten minutes to fit on my legs. Mm -hmm. So if I were, if I was to wake up in the morning, I have to prepare myself putting on the sleeves, the socks connecting the the legs together and that would be i'll say 10 minutes and just to stand up and get used to it and then drip throughout the day there will be fluctuations of body fluids so your sockets can come loose mm -hmm. and you get skin chaffing you get pressure sores the list goes on and on and i experienced quite a few of it during during my rehab only my rehab period i wasn't even walking in the real world but i started to feel all these problems especially skin breakdowns when a skin broke i had to be on the wheelchair for yeah. three weeks until my skin healed because my skin is very fragile it's where the skin graft area is so and that, that breaks. That kind of prosthetic then probably has a huge barrier to your recovery as well, right? Like on like in terms of getting yourself mobile. Yeah. So at the start, it was I was I was keen as a beaver to get these sockets, mainly because more for aesthetics. Look, I'll get a carbon fiber socket because I love my cars, and I'll have a carbon fiber socket around my around my above the knee. And I'll go, this looks cool. This looks cool. But in practicality terms, like, for example, sitting in a toilet or sitting in a high stool, it was. Yeah, not possible. Uh, yeah. It, you, 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 didn't, you won't think about that until you actually be in that situation. Yeah. So that's where I opted for RC integration. I, di I didn't know much about it. But all I remembered was my prosthetist mentioning it to me that, I'll be a suitable candidate for this procedure. I palmed it off because I was I was thinking of of the nice designs that I could get with my sockets. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did you end up? So so was there like um when you were in that point in your journey at the very beginning? Um, I guess how did you end up first with the sockets? Like, did you get advice with people? Like, did people? Do you find that 
I guess you're going, hey, I just have to put my all my trust in everyone. And then do they guide you in a certain path? And do you feel like you have the choices in those paths? Yeah, so I, the, that's the bit about the internet. Information is right there at our fingertips. So I was researching all the information on OSI integration, videos on YouTube and see what this, this new procedure was. And I saw it as a gateway for freedom. That was the main thing. And then I had to chase my prosthetist and ask him, when can, you I, come in. Yeah, can <laughs> I, can I go see the surgeon? Let's, let's get this, let's get this bore on, see if I'm eligible for it because there is a procedure. They have to make sure that mentally you're okay with a metal rod sticking out of your leg. Not many people are. Not many people are, are self-conscious about their, or they're, they're self-conscious about the appearance. Yeah, yeah very much. Ha- so. Having a foreign object sticking out of your leg, it kind of throws people off. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, in my case, hunting. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in my case, I was like, "Cool, this is yeah. this is mad." Yeah. You know, there, there was there was no off-putting about that. It, a metal rod sticking out. What more do you want? Yeah, yeah. So I, <laughs> yeah I mean, I, it's funny because I love um, technology and I just love all this kind of cool robotic sort of stuff. So to me, I'd be the same. But I reckon because I remember actually when I first saw you and I saw the the rod sticking out of your leg, I was thinking, you know, if someone's never seen that before, um, yeah, they'd be like, "What the hell is this?" And and even if it's yourself, you would actually probably have a fear of it because you. Think about it. You've never seen anything like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Case in point, I was at the prosthetist today and there was this lady who, who went to see the prosthetist too. She's in the traditional sockets and she was astounded at what she was looking at. She was looking at my legs. Yeah, not my looks, more more my legs. So that attracts the women. <laughs> <laughs> go figure. <laughs> hey, let's, but yeah. Let's, let's go it, back a Let's go back a step. Mate. You, you've already mentioned that you got an interest in cars. When you were in your sockets, what, what were your thoughts about driving at that point? At that point, I wasn't thinking about driving at all. I had no intention of driving, mainly because I'm, I'm an avid car lover and I love jumping into different cars. And the thought of just being stuck to one vehicle, modified vehicle, it, it 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 kind of delayed my my motive to get behind the wheel again. So your Call right your, your right legs amputated through the thigh. Yeah, just, so just to, to unpack it from a driving point a bit, your right legs amputated through the thigh. And when you've got a your old prosthetic where you had the socket, did you have a active knee joint with that one, or was it a a, a fixed leg, or was it? Was it some kind of mechanical knee in there? For my left, no. No, but for your right? For my right, it was a, I've, I've got a microprocessor knee. Mm-hmm. So during that time of socket usage, I didn't really make use of my legs. The only times I used my legs was in rehab Mm -hmm. and at the park at my house and otherwise you're in the wheelchair otherwise i'm in the wheelchair yeah the main purpose of my legs during that time was to get better and better over time but then constant problems occurred Mm. delays and all that so when did when did driving come into the into the picture then after osseo integration I was, I was probably, I'll say almost two years until I started looking at driving. Mm-hmm. Within that two years, I, I had my freedom already, but I was just missing that one piece. And that was being independent enough to take myself to the shops, take myself to my friend's house. So I, I made that next step to contact my occupational therapist and go, I think I, it's, I'm, I'm ready to drive. At that point, 
I, I came to the conclusion that, all right, I'm going to be driving hand controlled cars. So it's about time that I got to deal with it. I got to be fine with driving just that one car, a modified car. That was the hold back. That was the only limit, limiting belief to be stuck in one vehicle. But then I knew, you know what? I, I, I got to drive. So I made that choice to get in contact with my occupational therapist. So are you driving with, uh, so you, you started to explore hand controls with your OT. Did you, did you, do you drive? Did you drive with hand controls? I drove with hand controls for one session. One session. <laughs> one session. <laughs> why, why, why did you ditch it after that? <laughs> um, so a little story about it. They came over to my house, the drive instructor and the occupational therapist, and I had to go through a test to see my competency, um, memory test, just to see if I'm a, if my, if I'm aware, you know, with all these little fast reaction tests that they made me do, and they said, "Wow, you you've got a normal reaction, even better than some people," and then we were at the next step of looking at different hand controls, the, the ghost, ghost ring and yep. or the levers and all that. But during that time, when we were going through different driving methods, I showed them a video on YouTube, a video of an amputee driving with their legs. Yeah. And they, they did not know that it was possible. And I told them that, yeah, my, my leg, my leg that I currently have, it has a driving mode. And that sparked in a, a light. That sparked something. And when in they, you they or looked, in them? In, you in or them. In them. It sparked, it sparked yeah. something in them because they realized that my leg has a drive function that they did not know. All right. Mate, so, we've, we've got to unpack this for the listeners, mate. What does a drive function in your leg mean? I mean, I don't have a drive function in my leg, I don't reckon. What does a drive function in your leg mean? So I've got a genium. I had a genium. It's by Autobot and it's Bluetooth enabled. And it's Bluetooth enabled. It enables us to have different modes, different modes that we could set on our legs like uh, standing mode so it doesn't bend to golf mode to swimming mode to driving mode yes driving that was one of the options that i asked my processors to put in after i told the occupational therapist and the driving instructor about this mode and they were ecstatic because they go like, all right we're going to go get your license with your legs. And I was like, what? Are you serious? And they go, yeah, because they did not know about what my leg could do. Mm -hmm. So they were very excited. But as I said, we did go through one driving lesson with hand controls, but the intention was to, and is to get my license on my legs. But they were there already, so... Let's go drive with whatever they had set up and then wait for myself to get my driving mode installed into my, my leg. Then I could arrange for my, my driving practices. And I think I went through probably around three or four lessons until I went for my test. That's pretty good. Did you, um, did you, when you found this, I guess, uh, sharing about the driving mode with the therapist and the guys around you. Um, it sounds like you didn't get much pushback or resistance. They were pretty supportive of it. They were very supportive because they said, we're going to get your license on your legs. Yeah, that, that's good. I, 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 they, they weren't umming and ahhing. They were adamant that I was going to get my legs. And they yeah. said that I was probably the first one in New South Wales 
yeah, yeah, to get our I mean, approved. It's really, uh, really cool to hear because that's one of the reasons that I'm uh, and Brad and I are doing this podcast is to kind of share these stories around because what we find is true to what you just said. That one of the most common things I find, even when we're showing all these whiz bang products, is the industry goes, I never even knew that thing was around. You know, because we're so we're a bit in the dark ages in Australia, you know, and um, and it's such a small industry. So it's and then when they do find out about the stuff, sometimes I find you might get a bit of pushback. So it's really it means you had a good team around you, you know, um, that they're willing to support what you wanted to do. So it's good. Yeah, and that's the beauty about the internet. As I said, one click and we can find thousands of videos yeah. relating to that topic. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's where it started, and that's where it sparked my curiosity of. There is a driving way, but in saying that, it was all the legal issues that I thought Australia had, as in driving with legs. I thought, no, no way we can do that. They're not going to let us drive with legs, or they're not going to let me drive with my prosthetic legs. It, it might, that must seem it's, a, it's dangerous or something. What the videos I see online on YouTube, they're in America. So, you know, different rules. Yeah. But that was my thought process. It wasn't until I encountered with the OT and driving instructor that they said, no, we're, we're, we're going full steam ahead with getting your license on your legs. Yeah, yeah. And that was, that was a godsend because I, I went in with the, assumption of getting my driver's license and leaving with hand controls yeah 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 it's just just a couple of things just to help unpack for the uh listeners of this uh because they they might be having a right leg above knee amputation and never heard of this type of thing so it's an autobock genium is that right yes it's an autobock genium i'm sure there's other companies that do it but with my leg i've got an autobock genium yeah, that's the one I've heard of as well. And um, yeah, that's the one you, we, from my knowledge, and you'd know it better than what I do, and maybe we'll get a prosthesis to, to make comment if they're listening. Um, you set your knee at a certain degree, is that right? That's correct. You set it at a certain bend. What's your, so what's I, your bend? I've got four bends. I think I've got 42 degrees, 45, 35, and 37. And that's the for reason different cars? Yeah, that's correct. Different yeah. cars because I'm not a one man car. I'm like one car man. Yeah, how many yeah. cars do you have? <laughs> um, how many friends do I have is unlimited. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I, I've, I, I've seen you on YouTube, and that's that's how we got to know each other. And um, I've I've seen you do some crazy stuff in your car. So do you want to share the types of things that you are out now actually doing? Like what? What are you? What are you doing in a car? You're not just going to the shops. <laughs> well, I'll take my car to the racetrack, and I use and carefully abuse my car. <laughs> I I use it to its potential. My car is a Audi S3. It's a it's a sports sedan, so I make use of it. I don't just go to groceries and and drive on the speed limit, I take it to the track and unleash the power that it has. <laughs> is, it, yeah, yeah. Is, it, um, is it like the new shape ones, S3s? Yes, it's the current shape S3. The, if, if you know about S3, the 8V, 8V yeah. S3. The current yeah. shape, not the update, not the facelift, but yeah, yeah. that shape. I know, because yeah. I've got a um, friend of mine who's got one of those and they're, um, they're bloody awesome. They're like a pocket rocket. They're tiny. When you look at it, it looks like a toy. Um, but man, they fly. They, they're yeah. all fast. So uh, no, I've seen him down the quarter mile, Ali. He's, uh, he, he goes for it. How do you take off on the quarter mile? Explain this uh, to the listeners. I've seen uh, this. This is hilarious. This, so, yeah, this is funny. So because my car's got launch control and to do a launch control, you need, you need your left foot. You need your left foot holding on the brake. So your right the- foot. So the people that are, we're, we're going to put this out on YouTube, yeah? So for people listening to this, you can actually go and see Kwa's uh, face and his massive guns and all that kind of stuff. He's actually got his leg on on the table as well. So you can uh, go and have a look at his left leg on the table, but that one doesn't uh, bend at the knee joint. So yeah, keep going, mate. I just wanted to explain 
fit to it. So you can't use that one in the car. Yeah, that- I can't use that one because every time I jump into the car, this leg comes off. Okay. Reason being because it's basically a straight leg and I can't get into a car without taking it off or bending, but I can't bend my leg. So I take it off. In terms of doing launch control, I can't do a launch control with my left leg because my left leg is not connected to myself. That's when the trusty walking stick comes in. <laughs> <laughs> that so acts he- as my left leg. So I've, I've seen this. Uh, he, you, you sit behind the steering wheel. You've got your left hand. You, you put it in drive. You've got your left hand on your walking stick pushing down the brake lever. And you've got your right leg heavily planted into the accelerator, yeah? That's correct. That's correct. And then when that green light goes, you chuck the walking stick <laughs> over the yep. back shoulder into chuck the back the and hold on for dear life. Yeah, chuck the walking stick and grab my left hand onto the steering wheel. <laughs> and oh. let the car do its thing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. That's, that's not the only racing you're doing, though, is it? You're doing other racing as well? You're doing track stuff? Yeah, I do track stuff too. So I did, I did the quarter mile, which we just mentioned, and the more exhilarating one would be going around the circuit, going around Sydney, Motor, Sydney Motorsport Park, doing 220 Ks down the main straight <laughs> at the first turn turning in at around roughly 170 Ks. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Just believing in the tires, believing that it, it's got my back. Yeah. <laughs> Have and you had a close call that you've had to jump on the brake? Yeah, there were, there were close calls. Um, I've, I've went off quite a few times in different tracks in Wakefield Park in Luddenham where I, I hit the chicane and it will just, it will just vibrate. I haven't lost the car because I'm a responsible driver. <laughs> <laughs> there was a wink there for people uh, oh, not wait. tuning into the YouTube bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be uh, censored. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, track days and quarter miles, it's, it's, it's ironic. I was involved in a high-speed car accident, yet... I'm piloting a car going at X amount of speed. It just shows that whatever had happened to me, I'm not holding myself back from doing what I love. Yeah, yeah. And that is cars and speed in a safe environment, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All right, so just, just one little thing. Uh, I know that if there's OTs listening to this, occupational therapists or some other clients and they're questioning, all right, we've talked about the knee, but what happens with the ankle? Um, so how do you compensate? Because your, uh, your leg, your prosthetic leg, the Autobop Genium, I don't think the ankle moves too much, does it? No, the ankles don't move. Yeah, but the so- ankle has flexion. So it, it flexes. It helps you assist in in walking. It yeah. gives you that energy return. I think I'm not too sure. I'm not a prosthetist myself, but like a feedback yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. A little bit so of it, it, step forward. I think. T- yeah, typically if you're driving a car, you're using your ankles, correct? Yeah, yeah. Ankles to accelerate, brake. Yeah. Whereas in my case, I'm using my hips. It's, yeah. all, it's all in the hips. Yeah. You're a very so, good Latin dancer, I understand. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty good. Only on one side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, very good. Hey, the mate. <laughs> the other thing that we've got you on for, mate, I'm going to let you do a plug. You've got something very exciting happening in your life right now. What else is it? Yes. I just had my book released. Oh, it's out, is it? Yeah, it's out. It came out. I've just announced it on the 9th of December, which was eight years to the day. In the making. Eight years to the day since my life-changing event. Yeah. And I just released my book book. What's, what's the book called? What's legless called? to Legless. Legless to Legless. And uh, what was the um, inspiration behind writing the book? I got told so many times that you should write a book, you should write a book. But at that point, I was, I just wanted to be 
like everyone else. Just, just live. Just do my own stuff. Just be me. But then I thought it would be it's selfish of me just to keep myself to myself. I'd rather inspire people, people who feel like they're down in a rut. And what better way is to be on television, be on radio, and now cemented by getting my story out on a book. Yeah, yeah. E-book, hardcover book. How long did it take you to write it? I was with a publishing company, Dean Publishing. Yeah. And they guided me from A to Z. Oh, yeah. Wow. We started in April. We didn't have a deadline. Well, I didn't have a deadline, but realized that they wanted to release it before Christmas. And Bob's your uncle. Yeah, yeah. He's out. That's, good. That's a good Christmas present. Yeah. Yeah, under the tree, everybody. Legal yeah, under the tree. And I should be getting my hard copies next week, I reckon. The cool thing about that is now um, you can add another thing to your career. Because you're now author, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm now author. I, this is my second book, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. My, my first book was, co, was a co-author. Yeah, okay. I co-authored with 17 other inspirational speakers. Okay. Yeah, and that came out a couple months earlier. What's that one oh, called? Wow. What's That's that one? called The Garden of Hope. The Garden of Hope. Yeah, Garden of Hope. 18 inspirational speakers, authors, sharing their story. Yeah, very excellent. Hey, mate, thank you so much. We've got one more question that we're going to ask every uh, person that comes onto our podcast. Are you ready for this? Yes. Yeah, oh. okay. So um, we're going to ask everybody that comes onto this podcast, and like we've said, you're, you're number one so um, person. So we really appreciate you coming on, but cars can be more than transport from A to B. Other than racing your car, What's one thing you've done in your car that nobody else knows? One thing I've done in my car. Oh. My car's modified. <laughs> modified? Not hand controls, but more power. <laughs> more power? <laughs> yeah, yeah. In uh, what way? Awesome, mate. Yeah. Um, cars in, so in full exhaust, in air filter, in computer. Oh yeah, yeah. To to aesthetics. Yeah, that sounds good. But yeah, that's the Audi S3. Audi S3. That's correct. Awesome. Ali mentioned last week that uh, he's he's taken someone wakeboarding behind his car. I I wouldn't want to hang on to the back of your car. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that'll go. You go flying. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Mate, thanks very much for for that. All right, that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for joining us and listening. A huge thank you to Kwa for joining us on this episode and talking talking through his driving experiences and getting back to driving without driving aids. If you want to get in contact, you can know what to do. Um, basically, what is actually the best way they can contact you? Yeah, They can find me on kwanamtran.com. Oh, yeah. No worries. And it's got all my socials, yeah, yeah. All my speaking, all my books, all my whatever you want to search for me, it's all on that website. So you're, you're, you're very active on all those mediums? On, on yeah, the... I, I'm very active on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and yeah. LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. Go see him drive, people. Do you just want to spell that out for us? dot com. Awesome. Mate, my biggest takeaway from this is just uh, what an awesome guy you are. And, uh, you know, I've, I've met you in the past. I've actually been in the car with this fellow and, um, and he drove me from um, a Mobility Expo that we're at once and drove me to the, uh, to the train station. And, um, yeah, mate, just watching you do that, if anyone wants to go and see that, you can go and check out William's OT Facebook page. It's a, it's a fair while ago now, about two years ago. But, yep. Uh, you're an awesome person and uh, we thank you very much for uh, um, putting us in the driver's seat, so to speak, of uh, your life. And uh, yeah, I thank you very much. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, thanks very much, mate. I really appreciate our time um, together. I really want to actually speak to you again for other other things. Like, I wouldn't mind hearing more about the gym stuff as well because I'm also into all the working out, and I've been doing CrossFit for the last couple of years. So I'm interested. Right. To... Well, let's let's give that a plug. Let's give that a plug, mate. So go on, oh, yeah. tell tell us oh, what, what else you do with your life. So you're a motivational speaker, your race car. Uh, yes. So I I'm a business owner in a in a gym franchise. Yeah, and yeah. you could find me lingering around that gym, which is Plus Fitness Warwick Farm. Oh yeah, awesome. I'm the I'm the local pest who harasses people with laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Go see him do a push up, people. Go see him do a push up. He takes. And, and on that note, with the laughter, that's the one thing I wanted to point out. Um, since I first met you a couple of years ago, that's the one thing which um, I found infectious, and I really appreciate is your great attitude, and I think that's the reason why you've got so much success in where you're going. And that's something which I think um, I really was really excited to have you here because I think it's an inspiration to share just your attitude with others because it, so many people that would have had, uh, you know, a situation like, similar to yours, just a shift in attitude will change that life, you know, um, and shift in perspective. So really thank you for spreading that because to me that's a pretty big important thing. So I really appreciate that. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me and... I am, I am grateful for you, for you guys to pick me as number one. Yeah, number number one, mate. Podcast. Couldn't, couldn't think of a better person to lead us off, mate. <laughs> uh, cheers. <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody, for tuning in. All right. Thank you. We'll see you next Bye. time. Bye. All right. Thanks for listening to the Drivable Podcast with Brad Williams and Ali Akbarian. Make sure you check out the Facebook page and socials. If you like what you have heard, make sure you like, rate, and subscribe. It makes a massive difference. If you or anyone you know would like to share your story about driving with a disability, make sure you reach out to us through the socials. Just search for us. For more information and the resources mentioned in this episode, then go to the Drivable Podcast on Facebook and tune into the next episode. See you next time.